In this week's Core Ultrasound Image Review, I have our regular co-host, Dr. Taryn Trott, EM critical care physician, but also we have a special guest, Aaron Tiagi, who's also an EM critical care physician that works with us at the University of Kentucky. Now this week, we're gonna review some choice cases that we've seen at the University of Kentucky. Check it out and let me know what you think. Hello, my name is Jacob Avila. This is Core Ultrasound Image Review. I have my co-host, Taryn Trott. Hello. And another one of our co-workers at the University of Kentucky, Aaron Tiagi. Hey. Uh, Aaron is a emergency medicine physician, did critical care. That's right. And is stoked about ultrasound. And so let's get right to it. Right. This is our first image right here. It's one of my favorite things to see. The eyeball in general, I mean, it's such a re- it's it? such a rewarding exam. It's so great! It's like this fluid filled orb. You have someone that loses vision for a proban. I bet you get a diagnosis fifty percent of the time. Yeah, that's true. And also, like, how many times do you use the ophthalmoscope? A what? Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's so hard. That it's so small. Negative. Yeah. yeah, I totally saw the back of that person. Yeah, yeah, I for totally. sure saw it. Um, you guys must have done it in Iowa, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you for sure did, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> so uh, what parasite are you showing us right now? Yeah, so this is ascariasis of the eye. That's right. Intraocular um, ascariasis. Ascar- Very ascar- common in Kentucky. Ascariasis? I yeah. try not to pronounce it. Yeah, okay. Um, Aaron, what do, you, what do you see here? Well, uh, aside from the free-floating parasite, <laughs> looks like a uh, not normal eyeball. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. We got a posterior chamber here. What's this squiggly thing? It's not It's not a worm. No, Just to be was, perfectly clear, it is most definitely not a worm. It's like a retina where it shouldn't be. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sure. that's a retina where it shouldn't be. Um, it's, it's classic story is going to be somebody comes in with vision loss. You look, you see this floaty thing. Um, it's really important that you have your patient move their eye side to side so that you can see where it's tethered. Yeah. Just how you tell the difference, right, between a vitreous and a retinal detachment? What would a, what would a vitreous detachment look like, Taryn? You would bore. You'd have more hyperechoic kind of stuff. S- stuff usually, yeah. yeah. Some component of hemorrhage often. Mm-hmm. Often, yeah. And then that line, instead of being tethered into the optic uh, nerve, which is this thing right here, is actually It'd be just like be collapsed throughout the globe. Exactly. So it'll be like a line across here. Um, that's really how I tell the difference. And this is probably, I think, the easiest thing for us to diagnose. We have very high specificity for this if we see it. So it's a really sweet examination. This one's so exciting. This is a good one. This one's so exciting here. Uh, So let me tell you, can I tell you guys this story? So this is a patient that came in, car wreck, and just the most swollen eye. The most swollen eye. And we're we're going through the whole thing, but we can't get her eye open. I have this this trick where I get a paper clip and I open it up and then bend one end so it creates like a little hook to get it into the eye and pull Mm. up the eyelid and then it doesn't apply any pressure to the eye. And I could not. I mean, you see all of this soft tissue swelling right here? That, that was probably the first thing that stood so out. So much. Is that you probably have centimeters of soft tissue edema. And you can imagine that person's exam was just like a yeah. giant puffy face. Yeah, it was. I mean, we couldn't see anything. Like, it was just insane. And I don't have it on this clip, but there was actually like a two to three centimeter actual like hematoma in the eyelid as well. So you also have like a lot of soft tissue swan, but there was actually a physical like three centimeter hematoma. It almost looks like you catch it at the very end of the clip. How it almost looks like it collects right there. Yeah, that's and, that was so. that was probably it. I think this is just excellent too because how many times do you get that old person who falls mm-hmm. got to, gets all this hematoma and mm-hmm. we're not even thinking, why don't we just throw the ultrasound on there yeah. and just take a look at the eyeball. So yeah. It's definitely a great agent. I know some people will get as far as doing pupillary response mm-hmm. when yeah. you can't see it. You know. Yeah, you totally could. Um, the one thing, um, we actually uh, showed this for our, our um, resident conference this morning, mm-hmm. and somebody asked, which is like a really good point. They said, well, what about this thing that I've heard that if you have a concern for a, a ruptured globe that you don't want to use ultrasound? And uh, what are your thoughts? Well, that crossed my mind when I first Mm -hmm. looked at this because part of this clip shows a layer of air. Yeah, yeah. That's so you're talking about like this like hyperchoic rim with the shadowing underneath it you see here. So in the back of my mind I was like thinking is there a chance we're looking at an ultrasound of a ruptured globe because Mm -hmm. there's air in there. But I think we can tell that 
the air is anterior to the eye. Right. So I think we're out of that. But in terms of ultrasounding a ruptured globe, last I knew that was kind of a faux pas. Yeah, so that's how I was taught too. But here's like, and this is not like science-based at all. This is just me kind of thinking through it. So here's my thought. In order, so if you have this patient, let's say you don't have a paper clip, how would you try and get this eye open to see if the patient maybe had a ruptured globe? <laughs> what would you use? Your hands, your <laughs> fingers, right? <laughs> Probably getting Q-tip way too aggressive, yeah. riffing. Yeah, Q-tips. yeah, you have you have to apply right. anterior posterior pressure to create enough traction to try and open Very up true. the eye, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and we don't like. We, we're like more okay with that than with doing this. Now, when <laughs> I'm doing this, I'm using like two centimeters of gel. That's a very good like point. Like so much gel. My finger, you know, I have the, the probe. Where's my phone? Here you go. I have the probe basically super high up, super low right here. And then let's say that this is, you know, the head. Like what I do is I basically put my pinky on it and that's where all of my pressure is. It could be right. cheek, it could be forehead, it could be nose. That's where all the pressure is. And I'm very light with my touch using a yeah. lot of gel. And I would argue that that is less pressure than trying to look at it any other means that we have. Yeah, so that's that's, that's my point. thought on it. And I don't, you know, as everybody as has their own opinion. You're a reasonable person when you're doing it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it right. may actually be less. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's and that's like patient. yeah, exactly. That makes, a lo- that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. No, oh, that's my thought. Do you? What do you do? You no, that sounds great. I think that's a great point too. We did not squish eyeball goo out of the side. It was a rupture, anyways. Um, so oh, this is one of my. I mean, I, everything's my favorite. Let's yeah, be honest. Everything's my favorite. <laughs> but this is um, something I'm very excited about. So this is weird, right? We have a liver here. This is a subxiphoid curvilinear transducer. I have this here, and there's something weird going on over here that we rarely see. The history, I actually don't know what the history is, but let's say it was somebody who had sudden onset of pain after vomiting. Let's say it was a trauma to the chest. What could cause this, or what does cause this thing right here, this, this kind of repetitive artifact? So we're seeing A-lines in the chest. That's so weird, right? Because A-lines are supposed to be in the lungs, are supposed to be in the Right, 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 right. Yeah. So I don't know. What, what so air. Air, yeah, yeah. air. And this does not appear to be in the pericardium because if it was, it often you'll see it all the way across. I've seen pneumopericardium where you just see like a giant like pleural line okay. right here with second like A lines underneath it. This is just kind of off to the side, and this is actually more anterior, right? So, it, yeah, I feel like the pneumopericardium would get a lot of movement too. You're right. You're right. absolutely right. Rift the heart movement. Yeah, yeah, it's going to yeah. shuffle around. So, do you know was this patient awake and? While you were doing this, or were they intubated? Uh, okay. I believe so. Um, this was a uh, somebody that we got on our uh, image review okay. um, for the residents. Um, yeah, so this is uh, pretty sure. I text messaged the resident whose mm-hmm. name this was, mm-hmm. and pretty sure this is pneuma mediastinum. Okay. Me- mediastinum? Pneuma mediastinum. Mediastinum. You said mediastinum. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always get It's hard. <laughs> you got to commit. One it's, so, it's so difficult. Yeah, it's yeah. a pretty good image. You use your syllables. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, some, so this is not the only error effect you can see. Yeah. I've seen it before where it's pneumopericardium, and you'll see B lines um, next to the heart as well. So any error artifact in this view is either pneumomediastinum or uh, pneumopericardium. Some, sometimes you kind of come to that diagnosis by default when you realize you can't get the cardiac view. You're right. And then subsequently you realize, oh, it's because I'm getting all this error artifact. There's air in the pericardial space. That's a good point. Mm. That's actually a really good point too. Mm. Oh man, this image stresses me out so much, you guys. Mm-hmm. I get so stressed out about this. So I'll tell you, this is it's in the it's in the lower abdomen. A lot of free fluid. A lot of free fluid, right? <laughs> we got this up here. There's maybe a little bit over here. There's some right here, and this little smile right here is like super concerning, mm-hmm. right? What do you what do you think it is, Aaron? Well, maybe a boy. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I agree. Maybe a boy, maybe a girl. It looks like a gestational sac. Yeah. Now, this is a very quick sweep, which is another one of the things that I like don't like, is that it's, a, it's kind of a fast sweep, so I can't really tell if there's any you know, fetal heart rate. Okay. Right? There's right. no M mode. But what I'm most concerned about here is that I have no idea if this is in the uterus or not. Yeah. No idea. So this could be like an ectopic, a ruptured ectopic. I have no idea right i mean granted the the amount of free fluid here i'm hoping whoever did this 
identified it as that. But this is an inadequate view to make sure that the patient has an intrauterine pregnancy or not. What you need is you need this right here. You need... Oh! Oh, my goodness. <laughs> 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 A little P-squirt right there, right? Right, right there. Right there. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, this is actually a little too shallow, to be honest. But it serves as a good example here. So here we have uterus, gestational yeah. sac, and we have the vaginal canal. You have to basically have that in the same plane as the uterus. Do you have to, make to get sure. the P-squirt as well? You do. You do. It is an, it's, you, you can bill for more, actually, is what it is. Yeah, so it just depends on if you want, like, whatever, 0. Bet, 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7 RVs. Okay, good. I bet yeah. if they uh, turn down the gain on this, would be able to that's identify really the structures a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. And a little more depth, too, because mm -hmm. like, the patient might have free fluid down here. True. Um, that we can't see because it's a little um, anterior. But I'm going to give this person the benefit of the doubt. Hey. Maybe they, hey, maybe they just really wanted to get a better view of this right here, which, by the way, I'm not seeing, like... I don't see much of a flicker. I don't, I don't see much of a beady heart either. Kind of a bummer. And this is, unfortunately, it was an unlabeled. This is what we call a ghost scan. Ghost scan. Yeah, so it could have been anything, to be honest. Um, but it does not appear to be a live fetus, unfortunately. Sweet, do you have any other thoughts on that? It's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, pretty yeah. straightforward. Sick. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this quick Quartzon image review. Um, do you guys uh, want to come back next week? Same time, same place, same clothes. Mm -hmm. Same clothes, same basement. Same basement, everything the same, same next week. Same facial hair. All right, that sounds uh -huh. good. I'll yeah. see, I'll see yeah. you guys here. See next week. I hope you enjoyed those cases. To recap, when you are looking for an intrauterine pregnancy, make sure that you can see that vaginal stripe. That will help you make sure that that gestational sac that you see is actually in the center of the uterus and not off to the side or not in the uterus at all. If you see an air artifact when you're trying to look at the heart, be suspicious for pneumopericardium or pneumomediastinum. When looking at the eye, if you ever have so much soft tissue edema that you can't really even open up the eyelid to see the eye, consider using your ultrasound transducer. If you're doing that though, make sure that you use a lot of gel and make sure that you're not applying any pressure directly to the eye. With regards to retinal versus vitreous detachments, look for that squiggly line. If that squiggly line attaches directly to the optic nerve, then that is a retinal detachment. If that squiggly line goes over top of the optic nerve, it is a vitreous detachment. Can't wait to see you guys next week and happy scanning.